There we go. There it is. Um, so uh, I'm going to start off with a very on-brand question. Uh, did you know that snow clearing can be sexist? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> People who have read my book aren't allowed to answer. Uh, anyway, for those of you who haven't read my book, I'm sure it sounds far-fetched, but bear with me. So uh, basically, the town of Karlskoga in Sweden, of course, because it was Sweden, uh, local government w departments were doing a gender audit of all their policies, again, Sweden. And it began with a joke, because apparently in Sweden they do still make jokes about feminists. And the joke was something along the lines of, well, we should probably have a look at the snow clearing schedule, because the feminists probably can't find anything you know, to say about that. But we did. <laughs> Very, very foolish to throw down the gauntlet to a feminist. Um, and when we did, not only did we improve the lives of women and children, we also saved the town money. I say we, obviously it wasn't me. Um, so basically, the, uh, the way they'd always done the snow clearing was that they cleared the major roads first, and then they cleared the local roads and the pavements. And it turned out that that was biased towards male travel patterns because men are more likely to drive. Um, even in households, so, uh, households that have a car, men are more likely to dominate access to it. And men have much more civil, simple travel patterns than women. They tend to do just a twice daily commute. Women, both because they're poorer and because of the aforementioned hogging of the car by men. Um, this isn't a man-hating speech, mainly. Um, they tend to use public transport. Um, oh, hello. Sorry. Um, they tend to use, I probably should have taken one of the walkie things. Uh, they tend to use public transport, and so women are more likely to be walking, basically. And they also tend to do this thing called trip chaining. Um, so they tend to drop the kids off at school before they go to work, uh, pick the groceries up on the way home, maybe pop in on an elderly relative. Uh, women do 75% of the world's unpaid care work, so that heavily factors into a lot of the ways that women end up doing various different types of things, and one of them is this, called, is this thing called trip chaining. Anyway, so Sweden decided, well, we'll just try and, we'll just switch it around. We'll start doing the local roads and the pavements first, um, and then the, the uh, major roads, because they figured it was easier to drive a car slowly through three inches of snow than to try and push a buggy, or to walk, or a wheelchair. Um, and they figured, well, it won't cost us any more money. They didn't realize that it would save them money, and it turned out that admissions to A&E fell significantly in the winter months. Um, and that cost had been about three times the cost of winter to road maintenance. Um, and that was basically because women are more likely to be pedestrians and therefore they are falling over um, and they were having more severe injuries. And so the moral of the story is that sexism doesn't have to be deliberate um, and feminism saves you money. Um, so if you don't go for Scarlett's very nice reason for being a feminist, maybe it can just be a money reason. Um, so how does this relate to exposing data bias in a world designed for men? Well, basically, the snow clearing schedule was devised on data that had a gender gap. And the men, and it would have been men who originally devised it, they knew how they traveled, and they designed it around their needs. So they didn't deliberately set out to exclude women, they just forgot about them. This is not unusual. So I first came across the gender data gap actually in my own head. Uh, I was 25, and I had gone to university as a mature student, um, and I was very much not a feminist. Um, I thought feminism was kind of embarrassing, really, and if women weren't, we were just a bit, a bit less shit, uh, probably they would be doing better. Um, anyway, so I had to write this book, write this book, read this book, <laughs> um, for an essay I was writing on uh, language and gender, and it was called Feminism and Linguistic Theory, which is a banging read, um, and it's by a woman called Debbie Cameron, and she was writing about uh, male default in language, and specifically, she was talking about uh, things like uh, generic male pronouns, so he to mean he or she, or man to mean humankind. And again, given my sort of slightly askance, side-eye attitude to feminism, you know, I'd heard of this kind of he means he or she, we shouldn't be saying this, how awful idea, but I'd always thought, oh, how trivial, God, feminists are so stupid, haven't they got something better to worry about? Um, but then the, there was this next line that came after that, which, where Debbie Cameron says that when women hear this, these words, man and he, they picture a man. And that just blew my mind. Because first of all, I realized, oh my god, I am picturing a man. And also I thought, I'm 25. How have I never noticed that I'm always picturing men when I don't know the gender of the person unless they specify that it's a woman? And so then I realized it was doctor, lawyer, politician, anything. I was always picturing men. Um, and it turns out, this is pretty common. 
This is Google search results for human. Um, and as you can see, the, our friend down there on the bottom who has suffered something terrible is more likely to be a human than a woman. Um, and in fact, while researching the book, I came across all sorts of research showing that this is very, very common. So one study I found particularly interesting where they looked at five gender neutral words, user, participant, person, designer, and researcher, and got men and women to picture what they heard, saw when they heard these words, and then draw what they pictured. Um, and basically, they just all pictured men, uh, about 70 to 80% of the time. Uh, a researcher was more likely to be depicted as a person of no gender than as a female by men. Um, Men also thought person was 80% uh, male. Uh, in fact, person was the only word that women pictured at 50-50 uh, male and female, which is nice. So women, women are aware, unlike men, that women are just as likely to be a person as men. But they, also, but they don't feel that, that way about user, designer, or researcher. Anyway, so it turns out that the way we tend to mean men when we say when we're talking gender neutrally, or thinking gender neutrally, or we think we're thinking gender neutrally, is pretty endemic. So just want to give you some examples of this. So as you can see, the Lego time teacher minifigure watch and clock, the Lego time teacher girl minifigure watch and clock, the male one gets to occupy the default. We don't need to point out it's male, because obviously it's male. Um, awesome girl, awesome kid, deodorant, women's deodorant, don't know what was going on there, but for Walmart, it was really important to make sure everyone knew where the women's deodorant was. Um, Bic for her, my favorite product. Um, so now look, everyone scoffs about Bic for her, but I thought, look, let's be fair. Women do have, on average, smaller hands than men, different grip strength. Maybe they've done some really amazing research, and you know, this Bic for her is a revolutionary new writing instrument. So I got in touch with Bic. I sent them 10 questions in an email. When was this new pen for women designed, and why? The product is marketed as designed to fit comfortably in a woman's hand. Could you let me know exactly what this means? Has there been research into how the original Bic pen does not fit comfortably in a woman's hand? Did you base your design of the new pen or research into women's hand size and or grip? If so, could you point me towards the research that was used? What exactly were the design changes that were made in order to ensure that the new pen did fit comfortably in women's hands? How did you ensure the changes were beneficial to women's use of the pens? Was the new pen tested in women users? How was the original Bic pen designed and tested? Is the original Bic pen unsuitable in any way for women's hands? Anyway, so this started off 10 days of back and forth and multiple emails. We're just getting the information together for you. You know, we want to make sure we get it just right. OK. Anyway, finally, I get this email. Dear Caroline, thank you for taking the time to send us your questions regarding Bic for her. First and foremost, as a company, BIC is very sensitive to gender issues and supports empowerment and emancipation of women. Um, then there was this whole bump about their company missions, and this was the important part. Prior to launching any of our products, we systematically carry out consumer research and conduct consumer feedback sessions for us to determine how well we respond to demand and taste. Specifically, with the BIC for Her range, our objective was to meet the taste of our fashion-oriented customers through a high-quality, attractive writing instrument for which we created specific design, features, and packaging. When we launched in 2009, we received positive feedback and comments from consumers. Big for her range has now been discontinued. Best wishes, etc. <laughs> I tried several times uh, to get to the bottom of the research process, but I'm afraid I never actually did find out if the original Big Pen is, in fact, unsuitable for a woman's hand. But anyway, so before writing this book, uh, or before deciding to write this book, I, I'd known for a while that male default was a thing. I knew that sexism was a thing. I knew, as many people do, that women are chronically underrepresented in the media. Um, at last count, only 24% of the persons heard, read, or read about or seen in the newspaper, television, or radio news around the world uh, and are women. And that's exactly the same as the previous count five years earlier. Uh, were underrepresented in politics. There were more men called Steve than women at the latest Brexit talks in Chequers. Uh, were underrepresented in films. <laughs> Only 26% of speaking roles in G-rated Hollywood films go to women. Were underrepresented, underrepresented in banknotes and statues, even though I campaigned on them both, if you can believe that. Anyway, so I knew about that. I knew about this bias in culture. But, you know, culture's subjective, so, you know, maybe that's going to be more difficult. Uh, 
it didn't occur to me, I didn't know that this male bias extended to numbers, to science, to medicine. Uh, these areas that we told are objective, they're fact-based, nothing for feminists to worry our little heads about. Um, so I first became obsessed with the gender data gap in science when I was researching my first book, when I came across a thing about heart attacks. Now, as you can see, only men get heart attacks, and, um, and they all start with a pain in the chest, which is what I thought, pain in the chest, down the left arm. Turns out men do experience those heart attack symptoms, but women are more likely to experience breathlessness, fatigue, nausea, what feels like indigestion. In fact, only one uh, in eight women will experience chest pain. Um, and uh, despite this, however, these symptoms for women are called atypical. They are, in fact, very typical for women. Um, but the result is that women don't realize they're having a heart attack, um, and so they don't go to the doctor in time. Uh, if they do go to the doctor, the doctor doesn't necessarily realize they're having a heart attack. Women are 50% more likely to be misdiagnosed if they have a heart attack. This is despite the fact that women have been more likely to, to die following a heart attack than men for the past 30 years. Um, and even the diagnostic tests that we've, been, that we've developed have been uh, developed around the way a heart attack progresses in men mechanically. So for example, looking for blockages, uh, women may not present with blockages. And so even, if, even for those one out of eight women who do, for example, experience chest pain and therefore get referred to one of the exciting new 24 hour centers uh, that are meant to deal specifically with heart attacks, uh, they get sent home with undiagnosed chest pain because they don't find a blockage. And then, of course, these women go home and they die. So I found that out, and I was pretty shocked. And then I found out that uh, animal studies are also being done on male animals. Um, and uh, the reason for that is that female animals are too hormonal and menstrual and unpredictable, which is typical of women, really, isn't it? Um, and uh, I mean, obviously, that just doesn't make any sense, does it? You know, we're 50% of the population, and these hormonal, complicated, difficult bodies are going to be taking the drugs that you're refusing to test on us. So we are being guinea pigs. You're testing on us once they're already out in the market. Small wonder then that out of uh, 10 drugs that got withdrawn from the market, eight of them were because of unacceptable side effects in women. Women are much more likely to suffer uh, adverse drug reactions than men and much more severe adverse drug reactions. Um, and generally get less effective treatment and more side effects. There was one really good example of this in America. Uh, the FDA had to tell women to cut their dosage of Ambien, a popular sleeping drug, uh, in half uh, because they um, basically discovered that women were going to work and crashing their cars because they were still under the influence from this uh, sleeping pill because it was the dosage was twice as high. And you will notice that dosages are gender neutral. They're not. They are uh, for men. Uh, and we don't really know what the safe dose is for most drugs, for a lot, for, well, for a lot of drugs for women. Anyway, so I was very, very shocked <laughs> to discover this, as I'm sure some of you, for those of you who aren't clever dicks who've already read my book, um, <laughs> will also be shocked. And I, you know, this was 2014 at the time. How is this still happening? Since then, I've, dis I've discovered that the, woo, that the results of the gender data gap appear everywhere. So I was very intrigued. I was very intrigued when I went to the loo to discover there was a massive queue outside the ladies. And I would really like it if one of the men here can tell me, how many cubicles and urinals do you have in the men's loo? One, oh, one what, one urinal? How many urinals? A oh, wow. <laughs> anyway, look, buy my book to find out why that's bullshit. Right, okay, so the vast majority of occupational health, I would go into it, but I, I know I'm giving um, Stephanie here a heart attack. The vast majority of occupational health research has been carried out on men and male-dominated jobs, meaning that women are working with chemicals whose impact on their bodies is unknown and using protection gear that doesn't protect them because it doesn't fit. The reason a woman is 47% more likely to be seriously injured and 17% more likely to die in a car crash than a man who is sitting beside her is that for decades we have designed car safety features around a crash test dummy that represents the 50th percentile male. 
As a result, women sit out of position. We sit too far forward in order to reach the pedals, which you would think is quite an important thing for us to do uh, in order to be able to drive. Seat belts don't accommodate the female form. The number one cause of fetal death, death from trauma uh, is car crashes because we haven't developed a seat belt that works for pregnant women. Um, belatedly, in 2015, the EU realized that women do in fact exist um, and introduced what they call a female crash test dummy. But it is, in fact, just a scaled-down male dummy. Um, and uh, obviously, women are not just scaled-down male men, men. But also, bizarrely, and I don't know how to explain this, they only use it in one out of five tests and only in the passenger seat. <laughs> um, so that's great. Uh, so I just want to talk about one other area, because this area scares the, the hell out of me, which is algorithms. So basically... Uh, the vast majority of algorithms are trained on highly male-biased data sets. Um, and therefore, they aren't recognizing women, or they are discriminating against women. So for example, voice recognition software doesn't recognize women. Um, and uh, hiring software, the, a huge number of CVs never even see human eyes in America, um, are discriminating against women. There was one particularly enraging example that someone came up with that a designer happened to reveal that their amazing coding source um, had found that if you happened to be a visitor to a Japanese manga site, uh, you were de you're definitely going to be a really great coder. Um, well, anyone who knows anything about the internet knows that these sites are probably not exactly uh, very welcoming to women. Also, as I mentioned, women do 75% of the world's unpaid care work. Uh, men have five hours more leisure time than women every week. Uh, husbands create seven hours of uh, housework for their wives every week. Um, so women just don't really have a lot of time to be spending on these Japanese manga sites. So basically what this coding algorithm software is saying is uh, hire men. Um, and we only know this because the designer happened to mention it. Um, and the, the huge concern I have is we're basically outsourcing the future to private companies. We don't get to look at their algorithms and see whether they're accounting for their male bias data. But based on that example, no, they absolutely aren't. Um, and based on what I was telling you about medical research, how would you feel about an algorithm diagnosing you if you're a woman? Because it's coming. So I've written Invisible Women because I want to challenge this male bias. The other half of my life, the activism half, has been spent campaigning to increase women's representation in public spaces, whether on our banknotes or statues in Parliament Square. And I view this book as the natural extension of that campaigning work. Because when women aren't seen, we are forgotten. And when we are forgotten, we end up poorer, sicker, and sometimes we die. It's 2019. It's time to stop forgetting women. It's time to start seeing women. Thank you.